Chapter 6, Eric Erickson. According to Freud, the job of the ego is to find realistic ways of satisfying the impulses of the id while not offending the moral demands of the superego. Freud viewed the ego as operating in the service of the id and as the helpless rider of the id horse. The ego, according to this view, has no needs of its own. The id is the energizer of the entire personality and is everything a person does and everything a person does is ultimately reduced to its demands. As we saw in chapter 2, Freud viewed enterprises such as art, science, and religion as mere displacements or sublimations of basic ideal, ideal desires. The first shift away from Freud's position came from his daughter Anna in her book The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense. Anna Freud suggested that instead of emphasizing the importance of the id, psychoanalysis should acquire the fullest possible knowledge of all the three institutions, that is, id, ego, and superego, of which we believe the psychic personality to be constituted, constituted to learn what are the relations in one, to one another and to the outside world. Eric Erickson was obviously influenced by his teacher, Anna Freud, but he believed she did not go far enough. Erickson gave the ego properties and needs of its own. The ego, according to Erickson, may have started out in the service of the id, but in the process of serving it, developed its own functions. For example, it was the ego's job to organize one's life and ensure a continuous harmony with one's physical and social environment. This conception emphasizes the influence of the ego on healthy growth and adjustment and also as a source of the person's self-awareness and identity. This contrasts sharply with the earlier Freudian view that the ego's sole job is to minimize the id's discomfort. Because Erickson stressed the autonomy of the ego, his theory exemplifies what has come to be called ego psychology. Although, as we saw in chapter 4, there are those who credit Alfred Adler with the founding of ego psychology, it is an honor generally given to Erickson, perhaps because he actually emphasized the term ego in his theory. Indeed, Erickson's entire theory can be viewed as a description of how the ego gains or loses strength as a function of developmental experiences. <coughs> Biographical sketch. Eric Erickson was born near Frankfurt, Germany on June 15, 1902. Erickson's mother, Carla Abrahamson, was a member of a prominent Jewish family in Copenhagen. In 1898, Carla, at 21, married a 27-year-old Jewish stockbroker, Valdemar Isidor Salmonson. The marriage did not last the night and was probably unconsummated. Speculation concerning Valdemar's rapid departure ranges from his involvement in criminal activities, causing him to become a fugitive, to the fact that he physically abused Carla, causing her to terminate the relationship. Carla never saw Valdemar after their wedding night. However, she retained his surname for legal purposes. When Eric was born four years later, the birth certificate listed Valdemar and Carla as his parents. Although Eric was technically legitimate, Valdemar was not his father. If Carla knew the identity of Eric's father, she never revealed it. Later in life, Eric made several attempts to determine the identity of his biological father, but was unsuccessful. Eric often proclaimed his biological father to be an artistically gifted Gentile of Danish royalty. This, however, was a family myth and was never substantiated. Carla began a relationship with Eric's pediatrician, Theodore Homburger, and the two were married on Eric's third birthday, June 15, 1905. Eric went along on the honeymoon. Theodore's proposal came with one provision. Eric was to be told that Theodore was Eric's biological father. Carla agreed. A few years after the marriage, Theodore adopted Eric, and legally he became Eric Homburger. The fact that Dr. Homburger was not Eric's biological father was kept a secret throughout his childhood but he still developed the feeling that somehow he did not belong to his parents and fantasized about being the son of, a, of much better parents. Erickson used his stepfather's surname for many years and wrote his first articles using the name Eric Homburger. It was only when he became a U.S. citizen in 1939 that he changed his last name to Erickson. The circumstances of Erickson's birth created a problem in adopting an appropriate last name. Eric's birth had resulted from an extramarital liaison of his mother's and Erickson kept her secret until he was 68. Because Erickson was not the name of his biological father, his reason for choosing this name is a matter of speculation. One story has it that his children were troubled by the American tendency to confuse Homburger with Hamburger, and that he asked one of his sons for an alternative. Being Eric's son, he proposed Erickson. For Erickson's children, such a name would be in accord with Scandinavian custom. 
but for Erickson, it con connoted that he was his own father, self-created. In any case, Homburger was reduced to the middle initial of the name that Erickson then used to identify his works. Erickson's sense of not belonging to his family was amplified by the fact that his mother Carla and his stepfather Theodore were Jewish. Erickson himself was tall with blue eyes and blonde hair. In school, he was referred to as a Jew, where at his stepfather's temple, he was called a goy, the Yiddish word for Gentile. Is it any wonder why the concept of identity crisis later became one of Erickson's most important theoretical concerns? Eric was well aware of, his influ of this influence on his later work. No doubt my best friends will insist that I needed to name the identity crisis and to see it in everybody else in order to really come to terms with it myself. After graduating from a gymnasium, roughly the equivalent to an American high school, he rebelled against his stepfather's desire for him to become a physician by studying art and roaming freely around Europe. Generally, Erickson was not a good student in school, but did have artistic ability. Erickson said, I was an artist then, which can be a European euphemism for a young man with some talent but nowhere to go. The year 1927 was a turning point in Erickson's life. In that year, at the age of 25, he was invited to Vienna by an old school friend to work at a small school attended by the children of Freud's patients and friends. He was hired first as an artist and then as a tutor. Finally, Anna Freud asked if he would like to be trained as a child analyst. Erickson accepted the offer and received his psychoanalytic training under Anna Freud, for which she charged him $7 per month. The training, which included Eric being psychoanalyzed by Anna, lasted three years and was conducted almost daily. Anna Freud's particular, Anna Freud's particular brand of psychoanalytic theory, which differed in several ways from her father's, had a profound influence on Erickson and in 1964, he showed his appreciation by dedicating his book, Insight and Responsibility, to her. When Erickson joined the Freudian circle, Freud was 71 years old, and Erickson knew him only informally. It was only gradually that Erickson came to appreciate Freud's accomplishments. At the time, however, Erickson deeply appreciated the warm reception given to him by those associated with the psychoanalytic movement. The situation was perfectly suited to Erickson, he was asked to join a group of people who were still considered to be outside the medical establishment. By joining this group of outcasts, he could maintain his identity as the outsider. Conversely, because the group's function was to help disturb people, he could at least indirectly satisfy his stepfather's desire for him to become a physician. His graduation from gymnasium, a Montessori diploma, and his training as a child analyst are the only formal training Erickson ever had. Because Erickson earned no advanced degrees, he is a clear example of Freud's contention that one need not be a trained physician to become a psychoanalyst. Erickson graduated from the Vienna Psychoanalytic Institute in 1933. The fact that Erickson was granted full, rather than associate membership, in the Vienna Psychoanalytic Institute also made him a member of the International Psychoanalytic Association. In 1929, Eric met Jean Sersen. Joan studied and taught modern dance at Columbia University and the University of Pennsylvania as she pursued her PhD in education at Columbia. Joan eventually became a member of Freud's circle and even began to be psychoanalyzed by Ludwig Jekylls, one of Freud's early disciples. During this time, Joan met Eric at a mass ball. They talked and danced throughout the night, and soon thereafter she moved in with Eric and became pregnant. At first, Eric rejected the idea of marriage, but he finally decided not to repeat the mistake his own father had made. They were married on April 1st, 1930, and Jean became Eric's intellectual partner for the remainder of his long life. In 1970, Erickson retired from Harvard University, and the Erickson family divided its time between Marin, Ca Marin County, California, and Cape Cod, Massachusetts. In 1987, Erickson moved back to Cambridge after the founding of the Eric Erickson Center, which was associated with the Cambridge Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Erickson died on May 12, 1994, in Harwich, Massachusetts. Joan, Eric's wife and collaborator for over 30, 60 years, died on August 3, 1997. As we see in this chapter, Erickson made several notable contributions to psycho psychology. One is the application of his theory of development to the study of major historical figures. Such an endeavor has been labeled psychohistory. Erickson has analyzed such historical figures as Adolf Hitler, Maxim Gorky, Martin Luther, and Mahatma Gandhi. Erickson's book, Gandhi's Truth, was awarded both the Pulitzer Prize and a National Book Award in Philosophy and Religion. Typically, all of Erickson's books sold well, but his last book, The Life Cycle Completed, a review, 
was mainly a summary of his previously published ideas and was poorly received. Months after the publication of this book, Erickson complained, I received only one letter saying, hey, thank you, that's a good book. Throughout most of his writings, Erickson insisted that a strong relationship exists between his theory and Freud's, but one gets the impression this is mostly a tribute to Freud. Although it is true there are some similarities between the theories, the differences between the two are more important. Erickson's theory, for example, is more optimistic about the human capacity for positive growth. We compare Erickson's theory to Freud's throughout this chapter, but for now we point out one common feature of the theories. Both have transcended the bounds of psychology and have influenced a variety of other fields such as religion, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, and history. Anatomy and Destiny the closest Erickson came to traditional Freudian theory is in the chapter The Theory of Infantile Sexuality in his book Childhood and Society. In this chapter, Erickson summarized his research on 10, 11, and 12-year-old boys and girls in California. The children were instructed by Erickson to build a scene from a movie. The children were to use toy figures and various shaped blocks. Much to Erickson's surprise, in over a year and a half, about 150 children constructed about 450 scenes, and not more than about six were scenes from a movie. For example, only a few of the toy figures were given names of actors or actresses. But if the children were not following Erickson's suggestion in creating their scenes, what was guiding their activities? The answer to this question came when Erickson noted that the common themes or elements in the scenes created by boys were quite different from those created by girls. Erickson observed, for example, that the scenes created by girls typically included an enclosure that sometimes had an elaborate entrance and contained such elements as people and animals. The scenes created by girls tended to be static and peaceful, although animals or dangerous men often interrupted their scenes. The scenes created by boys often had high walls around them and had many objects such as high towers or cannons protruding from them. The scenes created by boys also had relatively more people and animals outside the enclosure. The boys' scenes were dynamic and included fantasies about the collapse or downfall of their creation. Erickson concluded that the scenes created by the children were outward manifestations of their genital apparatus. This tendency was so reliable that Erickson was surprised and uneasy when a departure from it occurred. For example, Erickson recounted that one boy created what he called a feminine scene, but as the boy was leaving the room, he realized that there was something wrong with the scene and returned to rearrange it. A second boy, described by Erickson as obese and effeminate, created two scenes that were contrary to Erickson's expectations. Months later, when the boy was undergoing thyroid therapy, he returned and built a scene that Erickson approved as masculine. It should be emphasized, however, that Erickson never said that biology was the only factor that determines how a person perceives and acts on the world. Social factors are also important. We are instructed by our culture how boys and girls are expected to act and think, and these cultural dictates obviously influence our outlook. Am I saying then that anatomy is destiny? Yes, it is destiny, insofar as it determines not only the range and configuration of physiological functioning and its limitations, but also to an extent personality configurations. In other words, anatomy, history, and personality are our combined destiny. Needless to say, Erickson's view of male-female differences have not gone uncriticized. One reaction came from Naomi Weinstein in her article, Psychology Constructs the Female or the Fantasy Life of the Male Psychologist, with some attention to the fantasies of his friends, the male biologist, and the male anthropologist. Weinstein argued that psychology does not know why, what either men or women are really like because it deals with only the cultural stereotypes of both. She insisted that what have been called biologically determined differences in behavior between the sexes are really better explained as a result of social expectations. She concluded that insofar as there are differences between the sexes, they are, are the result of cultural expectations and the prejudices of male social scientists. Paula Kaplan also criticized Eric's contention that the type of sex organs one possesses influences how one interacts with the world. She was especially critical of Erickson's assertion that a woman's kinesthetic experience of her own inner space, that is, of her own uterus, determines even partially her personality characteristics. It was Erickson's belief that it is the female child's experience of this inner space that influences the configuration she produces during his play experiments. Kaplan pointed out that Erickson's claim is impossible. 
The most important physiological factor to take into account is that there is no inner space. The walls of the uterus touch each other, as do the walls of the vagina. They are open only when separated by and filled with substances as an intercourse or pregnancy. If girls' play constructions were to represent their uterine, they should look more like folded flapjacks than enclosures. Further, although the penis is external and erectible, so is the clitoris, although to a lesser degree. The movement of the ovum is as important for fertilization as that of the sperm, and although not as highly mobile as the sperm, both ovum and uterus move. The uterus contracts often in orgasm and delivery and certainly expands in pregnancy. So differences in play construction should, if biologically based, be different in degrees rather than in kind. Kaplan repeated much of Erickson's research on play constructions. However, she used preschool children as her subjects. She justified using children who are younger than those used by Erickson because of Erickson's claim that gender differences in personality manifest themselves throughout the lifespan. Kaplan summarized her results. No sex differences were found in the frequency of constructions of simple enclosures. Enclosures only in conjunction with elaborate structures or traffic lanes, height of structures, construction of a tower, or construction of a structure, building, tower, or street, all categories in which Erickson had reported sex differences. Kaplan interpreted her results as indicating that there are no sex-determined personality characteristics. If these characteristics exist, they would be evident in her young subjects. Rather, she said, the personality differences between men and women that emerge later are due exclusively to differential socialization practices. Therefore, anatomy is definitely not destiny. Erickson reacted to criticisms such as those discussed in his essay titled, Once More, The Inner Space. Essentially, he said that psych one, psychoanalytic truths are often disturbing and he can understand people being upset by them. And two, biology is only one strong determinant of personality and culture is another. Another important point should be made about Erickson's view of sexual differences. He did not say that males are better than females or vice versa. Rather, he said that there are important differences between males and females and that male traits and female traits complement each other. In some cultures, such as ours, the male role has been glorified relative to the female role. But Erickson found this unfortunate. He believed that both men and women are hurt by current cultural stereotypes. Erickson stated that only a renewal of social creativity can liberate both men and women from reciprocal roles which, in fact, have exploited both. Epigenetic Principle, Crisis, Ritualizations, and Ritualisms Epigenetic Principle Erickson saw life as consisting of eight stages, which stretched from birth to death. According to Erickson, the sequence of the eight stages is genetically determined and is unalterable. Such a genetically determined sequence of development is said to follow the epigenetic principle, a term Erickson borrowed from biology. Erickson described this principle as follows. Whenever we try to understand growth, it is well to remember the epigenetic principle which is derived from the growth of organisms in utero. Somewhat generalized, this principle states that anything that grows as, has a ground plan, and that out of this ground plan, the parts arise, each part having a special ascendancy, until all parts have arisen to form a functioning whole. Although, according to Erickson, personality unfolds across eight stages of development, all eight developmental stages are present in rudimentary form at birth. As each personality characteristic unfolds, it is incorporated into characteristics that develop during previous stages, thus creating a new configuration of personality characteristics. In other words, each stage as it unfolds builds on those that preceded it. According to the epigenetic principle, the personality characteristics that become salient during any particular stage of development exist before that stage and continue to exist after that stage. They merely become more prominent during their particular stage because they are needed to move through that stage and beyond. For social and biological reasons, however, the development of a certain personality characteristic becomes the focus of one stage as opposed to other stages. Crisis. Each stage of the development is characterized by a crisis. The word crisis is used by Erickson as it is used by physicians, that is, to connote an important turning point. Thus, the crisis characterizing each stage of development has a possible positive resolution or a negative one. A positive resolution contributes to a strengthening of the ego and therefore to greater adaptation. A negative resolution weakens the ego and inhibits adaptation. 
Furthermore, a positive crisis resolution in one stage increases the likelihood that the crisis characterizing the next stage will be resolved positively. A negative resolution in one stage lowers the probability that the next crisis will be resolved positively. Erickson did not believe a solution to a crisis is either completely positive or completely negative. Rather, he said the resolution of a crisis has both positive and negative elements. It is when the ratio of positive to negative is higher in favor of the positive that the crisis is said to be resolved positively. We say more about this in our discussion of the first stage of development, to which we turn shortly. In, according, in accordance with the epigenetic principle, a crisis exists in three phases. The immature phase, where it is not the focal point of personality development. The critical phase, where because of the variety of biological, psychological, and social reasons, it is the focal point of the personality development. And the resolution phase, where the resolution of the crisis influences subsequent personality development. If the crisis associated with the age stages of development are resolved positively, normal personality development occurs. If one or more crises are involved negatively, normal development is inhibited. In other words, each crisis must be positively resolved in the stage of development in which it is critical before a person is fully prepared to deal with the crisis that dominates subsequent stages. Although biology determines when the eight stages of personality development will occur, because the maturation process, maturational process determines when certain experiences become possible, it is a social environment that determines whether or not the crisis associated with any given stage is resolved positively. For this reason, the stages proposed by Erickson are called psychosocial stages of development, to contrast them with Freud's psychosexual stages. Ritualizations and Ritualisms for Erickson, it is essential to realize that personality development occurs within a cultural setting. Rather than viewing humans as warring, warring with their culture, as Freud did, Erickson emphasized the compatibility between individuals and their culture. In fact, to a large extent, the job of culture is to provide effective ways of satisfying both biological and psychological human needs. According to Erickson, a person's internal and external experiences must fit together, at least to some degree, if an individual is to develop and function normally in a particular culture. Erickson said, each successive stage and crisis has a special relation to one of the basic elements of society, and this for the simple reason that the human life cycle and man's institutions have evolved, evolved together. The harmonious interplay between unfolding personality requirements and existing social and cultural conditions is made possible by ritualizations. According to Erickson, ritualizations are recurring patterns of behavior that reflect those beliefs, values, customs, and behaviors sanctioned by a particular society or culture. Although it is ritualizations that make life meaningful within a particular society or culture, most individuals engage in them without knowing that they are doing so. Each child must be coaxed and induced to become especiated during a prolonged childhood by some form of family. He must be familiarized by ritualization with a particular version of human existence. He thus develops a distinct sense of corporate identity. We must realize from the outset that ritualization is an aspect of everyday life which is more clearly seen in a different culture or class or even family than in our own where, in fact, ritualization is more often than not experienced simply as the only proper way to do things. And the question is only why does not everybody do it our way? Ritualizations, then, are culturally approved patterns of everyday behavior that allow a person to become an acceptable member of the culture. They include characteristic ways in which we relate to each other, such as shaking hands, kissing, and hugging. They provide guides that set the boundaries between acceptable and unacceptable behavior, for example, you may be permitted to make bodily contact with a stranger at a dance, but such behavior may not be tolerated under other circumstances. Likewise, it may be permissible for a woman to wear a bikini on a beach, or as such attire may cause a stir at work or at school. Ritualizations guide almost every aspect of social behavior and are the mechanisms by which persons of a certain culture become socialized. Erickson seemed to believe that culture could exist in many equally valid versions. Indeed, Erickson believed that except for the requirement that ritualization satisfy basic human needs, culture was arbitrary. For example, many cultural variations exist for courting, mating, and childbearing practices, but these differences are less important than the fact that they all encourage reproduction and the perpetuation of the culture in which they occur. 
For some persons, the arbitrary nature of ritualizations, ritualizations is lost and their functional value is overlooked. For these persons, ritualizations take on significance far beyond what is necessary. Erickson referred to such exaggerated or otherwise distorted ritualizations as ritualisms. Ritualisms are inappropriate or false ritualizations, and they are the cause of much social and psychological pathology. For example, a ritualization within a culture might encourage addressing certain accomplished persons with titles and thus encourage a sense of respect for their status. To idolize or worship such persons, however, would be an inappropriate exaggeration of that ritualization and would thus be a ritualism. A ritualism, then, is a ritualization that has become mechanical and stereotyped. Such empty ceremonies lack the power to bond people of a culture together, thus subverting the original purpose of the ritualization. A current example would be an elaborate birthday party or wedding. These are not only about celebrating the individual or couple and sharing an experience with friends, they are instead about outshining others and flaunting one's economic accomplishments. We discuss the ritualizations and ritualisms associated with each stage of development in the next section. Eight Stages of Personality Development The most famous aspect of Erickson's work are his descriptions of the eight developmental stages through which he believes all humans pass and what happens to the ego during each of these stages. The first five stages of personality development proposed by Erickson closely parallel Freud's proposed psychosexual stages of development in the time at which they are supposed to occur. As to what is supposed to occur during these stages, however, little agreement exists between Erickson and Freud. The last three stages are Erickson's own and represent one of his major contributions to psychology. It should be noted that the epigenic principle determines the exact order in which the stages must occur. However, when they occur, it cannot be specified exactly. Therefore, the ages associated with each of the following stages should be viewed only as approximations. We label each stage according to the developmental level at which it occurs and according to the crisis it features. Infancy, basic trust versus basic mistrust. This stage lasts from birth through about the first year and corresponds closely to Freud's oral stage of psychosexual development. This is a time when children are most helpless and thus most dependent on adults. If those caring for infants satisfy their needs in a loving and consistent manner, the infants will develop a feeling of basic trust. If, however, their parents are rejecting and satisfying their needs in an inconsistent manner, they will develop a feeling of mistrust. If, caring, if care is loving and consistent and infants learn they need not worry about a loving and reliable parent and therefore are not overly disturbed when that parent leaves their sight, Erickson called the ability of the infant to tolerate the absence of the mother the first social achievement. He noted this maturational change in the child reflects the ability of the child to hold a cognitive image of the mother that is stable and predictable because the mother has herself been stable and predictable. The basic trust versus basic mistrust crisis is resolved positively when the child develops more trust than mistrust. Remember, it is a ratio of the two solutions that is important. A child who trusted everyone and everything would be in trouble. A certain amount of mistrust is healthy and conducive to survival. It is a child with a predominance of trust, however, who has the courage to take risk and who is not overwhelmed by disappointments and setbacks. Erickson said that when the crisis characterizing a stage is positively resolved, a virtue emerges in one's personality. A virtue adds strength to one's ego. In this stage, when the child has more basic trust than basic mistrust, the virtue of hope emerges. Erickson defined hope as the enduring belief in the attainability of fervent wishes, in spite of the dark urges and rages which mark the beginning of existence. We can say that trusting children dare to hope, a process that is future-oriented, whereas children lacking trust cannot hope because they must worry constantly, whether their needs will be satisfied and therefore are tied to the present. Numinous versus Idolism the primary ritualization during this stage is the numinous. The numinous involves the various ways that mothers attend to their infant's needs in a particular culture. Although personal, these mother-infant interactions also reflect culturally sanctioned child-rearing practices. For example, many mothers breastfeed their infants, but in the United States, few have done so in public until recently. 
In a similar vein, it is not uncommon for mothers to babble inanely at their infants, imitating the babbling and cooing sounds that the baby makes rather than speaking to the infant as if he or she is a cognizant adult. As a result of these mother-infant interactions, the child develops positive feelings toward the mother, and these feelings cause the infant to be socially responsive. Thus, the mother's warm, predictable caring for the child creates in the child a desire to seek interactions with persons other than the mother. If the infant's normal reverence and respect for the mother becomes exaggerated, the ritualism of idolism results. Idolism occurs when normal respect and deep appreciation for person become excessive admiration and idealization. Idolism steers the developing child in the direction of blind hero worship. Early Childhood Autonomy versus Shame and Doubt This stage occurs from about the end of the first year to about the end of the third year and corresponds to Freud's annual stage of psychosexual development. During this stage, children rapidly develop a wide variety of skills. They learn to walk, climb, push, pull, and talk. More generally, they learn how to hold on and to let go. Not only does this apply to physical objects, but to feces and urine as well. (coughs) In other words, children can now willfully decide to do something or not. Thus, children are engaged in a battle of wills with their parents. The parents must perform the delicate task of controlling the child's behavior in socially acceptable directions without injuring the child's sense of self-control or autonomy. In other words, the parents must be reasonably tolerant but still be firm enough to ensure behavior that is socially approved. If the parents are overly protective or unjust in their use of punishment, the child will be doubtful and experience shame. Erickson saw this stage as a development of balance between independent willfulness and social cooperation. Can the child experience self-control without a loss of sense of self, or does a child lose self-control and experience external forces of control that induce shame and doubt? If the child develops more autonomy than shame and doubt during this stage, the virtue of will emerges. Erickson defined will as the unbroken determination to exercise free choice as well as self-restraint, in spite of the unavoidable experience of shame and doubt in infancy. Again, it is important to note that the positive resolution of the crisis characterizing this stage does not mean the child no longer experiences shame and doubt. Rather, it means the child's ego becomes strong enough to deal adequately with the inevitable experiences of shame and doubt. Notice that the virtues emerging as a result of positive crisis resolutions are ego functions. For example, The virtues of hope will have some influence on the quality of one's life, but little on survival. Persons without much hope or will do survive. That is, they are able to satisfy their biological idinal needs, but they probably are not as flexible, optimistic, or generally as happy as those with more hope and will. Judicious versus Legalism Autonomy is best served when one's will is freely exercised. Because each culture restricts some behaviors and allows others, However, the child must learn to discriminate between right and wrong, between what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. Erickson called judiciousness the ritualization by which the child learns what is culturally sanctioned and what is not. Through judiciousness, the child learns the laws, rules, honor practices, and regulations that characterize a child's culture. Before this stage, it was the parent's responsibility to guide the child's behavior properly. Now, however, as the rules and regulations of a culture are internalized, the child begins to judge his or her own behavior as well as that of others. Children must learn to judge themselves as others judge them. As the superego develops, it is used by the child to make moral evaluations. The perversion of the ritualization of judiciousness is the ritualism of legalism, which Erickson defined as the victory of the letter over the spirit of the word and the law. It is expressed in the vain display of righteousness or empty contrition, or in a moralistic insistence on exposing and isolating the culprit, whether or not this will be good for him or anybody else. For the legalistic child or adult, the punishment and humiliation of transgressors is more important than the intent of the law that was transgressed. Preschool Age Initiative versus Guilt this stage occurs about, from about the fourth year to about the fifth year and corresponds to Freud's phallic stage of psychosexual development. During this stage, the child is increasingly capable of detailed motor activity, refined use of language, and vivid use of imagination. 
These skills allow the child to initiate ideas, actions, and fantasies, and to plan future events. According to Erickson, the child during this stage is apt to develop an, an untiring curiosity about differences in sizes in general and sexual differences in particular. His learning is now eminently intrusive and vigorous. It leads away from his own limitations and into future possibilities. In the preceding pages, children learn that they are people. Preceding stages, children learn that they are people. Now they begin to explore what type of person they can become. During this stage, limits are tested to learn what is permissible and what is not. If parents encourage children's self-initiated behaviors and fantasies, the children will leave the stage with a healthy sense of initiative. If, however, parents ridicule the children's self-initiated behavior and imagination, they will leave the stage lacking self-sufficiency. Instead of taking the initiative, they will tend to experience guilt when pondering such behavior and therefore will tend to live within the narrow limits that others set for them. A good example of this is witnessed in a doctor's office. A four-year-old male child was playing with a dollhouse and was harshly reprimanded for playing with dolls. If this type of parenting is consistent, this child will learn not to take initiative, but instead experience guilt when they try something independently because they fear being incorrect. If children develop more initiative during this stage than guilt, the virtue of purpose will emerge. Erickson defined purpose as the courage to envisage to envisage, envisage and pursue valued goals uninhibited by the defeat of infantile fantasies, by guilt and by the foiling fear of punishment. Children who have positively resolved the crisis of the first three stages possess the virtues of hope, will, and purpose. Authenticity versus impersonation. In addition to playing with toys, children at this stage typically engage in a great deal of play acting, imitating, wearing costumes, and even pretending to be various types of animals. Such play provides them with an intermediate reality where they can explore the relationship between their inner and outer worlds. Both positive and negative roles are played to reconfirm the limits on behavior, the process of trying on various roles and reconfirming what is possible and what is not. Children discover the mix of roles that is just right for him or her. Erickson referred to those activities as the ritualization of authenticity. Exaggeration of the ritualization of authenticity results in the ritualism of impersonation. That occurs when one confuses one's true self with one or more of the roles that one plays. Rather than a role becoming just a part of the true self or furnishing information about it, the child becomes the role he or she plays. What is lost in such a case is the rich blending of personality characteristics that had developed during the previous stages into a unique, authentic person. School age. Industry versus inferiority. This stage lasts from about the 6th year to about the 11th year and corresponds to Freud's latency stage of psychosexual development. Most children attend school throughout this stage. It is during this stage that children learn the skills necessary for economic survival, the technological skills that will allow them to become productive members of their culture. Erickson saw children at this important stage of socialization as almost ready to become adults and parents. The problem, however, is that they must put their lives on hold to attend school and learn to be productive workers under the direction of others. The exuberant imagination is tamed and harnessed to the laws of impersonal things. School is a place where children are trained for future employment in an, in an adjustment to their culture because survival requires the ability to work cooperatively with others. Social skills are among the important lessons taught by the schools. The important lesson that children learn during this stage is the pleasure of work completion by steady attention and persevering diligence. From this lesson comes a sense of industry, which prepares children to look confidently for productive places in society among other people. If children do not develop a sense of industry, they will develop a sense of inferiority that causes them to lose confidence in their ability to become contributing members of society. Such children are more likely to develop a negative identity a concept that is explained in our discussion of the next stage. Another danger associated with this stage is that children may later overvalue their positions in the workplace. For such people, work is equated with life, and they thus are blinded to the many other important aspects of human existence. They begin to equate their work with their worth, and many overfocus on, on only this aspect of their life. According to Erickson, the skills necessary for future employment must be encouraged during this stage but not at the expense of other important human attributes. 
If children's sense of industry is greater than their sense of inferiority, they will leave this stage with the value of competence. Competence is the free exercise of dexterity and intelligence in the completion of tasks unimpaired by infantile inferiority. Like the virtues discussed earlier, competence comes from loving attention and encouragement. A sense of inferiority comes from ridicule or lack of concern by those persons most important to the children. Formality versus formalism. During this stage, children learn that to be a productive member of their community, they must possess real, not imagined, skills and knowledge. Erickson called the ritualization corresponding to this stage formality, and it involves learning the appropriate ways of doing tasks. Whatever the child does, whether it be at school, at home, at work, or on the athletic field, he or she must learn to do it properly. The exaggeration of the ritualization of formality results in the ritualism of formalism. Formalism is demonstrated with an over-concern with technique and a blindness, and a blindness to the purpose of the mean and meaning of a task occur. The student whose only concern is with high grades exemplifies formalism. Adolescence. Identity versus role confusion. This stage occurs between about 12 and 20 years of age and corresponds roughly to Freud's genital stage of psychosexual development. Erickson is best known for his description of this psychosocial stage for it contains his well-known concept of identity crisis. Erickson believed that this stage represents a transition between childhood and adulthood. In the preceding stages, Children were learning who they were and what it was possible for them to do, that is, the various roles that were available to them. During this stage, children must ponder the accumulated information about themselves and their society and project themselves into the future. In doing so, they make the first steps in gaining identity and becoming adults. The stage itself, however, is viewed as a time of searching for identity, but not of having one. Gaining a personal identity marks the satisfactory end of the stage, but it is not the end of identity development. Erickson did not define identity as a fixed phenomenon that is achieved at the end of his fifth stage and is set for life. Rather, once it is initially established, identity continues to develop and be redefined throughout adulthood. Furthermore, Erickson viewed identity as a largely unconscious or non-conscious, always interacting with and being molded by culture, and often expressing negative characteristics such as prejudice and bias. Erickson called the interval between youth and adulthood a psychosocial moratorium. Erickson vividly described what it is like to be in this period between childhood and adulthood. Like a trapeze artist, the young person in the middle of vigorous motion must let go of his safe hold on childhood and reach out for a firm grasp on adulthood, depending on a breathless interval on a, re on a relatedness between the past and the future and on the reliability of those he must let go of, and those who will receive him. Erickson used the term identity, sometimes called ego identity, in a variety of ways. For example, it is a feeling of being at home in one's body, a sense of knowing where one is going, and an inner assuredness of anticipated recognition from those who count. Erickson made no apology for using the term identity in a variety of ways. Because it is a complex concept, he thought it must be approached from many angles. If young adults do not leave this stage with an identity, they leave it with role confusion, or perhaps the negative identity. Role confusion is characterized by the inability to choose a role in life, thus prolonging the, psycho the psychological moratorium indefinitely or to make superficial commitments that are soon abandoned. Negative identities are those roles that children are warned not to assume. Erickson defined negative identity as an identity perversely based on all those identifications and roles which, at critical stages of development, have been presented to the individual as most undesirable or dangerous, and yet also as most real. Erickson gave an example. A mother who is filled, who is filled with unconscious ambivalence toward a brother who disintegrated into alcoholism may again and again respond selectively only to those traits in her son which seem to point to repetition of her brother's fate, in which case this negative identity may take on more reality for the son than all his natural attempts at being good. He may work hard on becoming a drunkard. For Erickson, the concepts of role confusion and negative identity explain much of the unrest and hostility expressed by adolescents in this country. For example, the adolescent may lash out at those identities that do not fit him or her. 
The loss of a sense of identity often is expressed in a scornful and snobbish hostility toward the roles offered as proper and desirable in one's family or immediate community. Any aspect of the required role or all parts may be it masculinity or femininity, nationality or class membership, can become the main focus of the young person's acid disdain. Why should an adolescent choose a negative identity if a positive one is not available? Erickson said because an adolescent would rather be nobody or somebody bad or indeed dead, and this totally by free choice, than be not quite somebody. If young adults emerge from the stage with a positive identity, rather than with role confusion or a negative identity, they will also will emerge with the virtue of fidelity. Erickson defined fidelity as the ability to sustain loyalties freely pledged in spite of the inevitable contradictions of value systems. The stages preceding this provide the child, provide the child with the qualities from which an identity could be derived. In this stage, the person must synthesize this information the development of an identity marks the end of childhood and the beginning of adulthood. From this point on, life is a matter of acting out one's identity. Now that the person knows who he or she is, the task of life becomes one of caring that a person optimally through the remaining stages of life. Ideology versus Totalism The ritualization corresponding to this stage is ideology. The adolescent searches for an ideology that synthesizes all the ego developments from the previous stages. The ideology furnishes a game plan for life. It gives life meaning. An identity cannot emerge until all previous ego functions are integrated and commitment to an ideology allows such integration. A chosen ideology could be religious, political, or philosophical. The only stipulation is that acting in accordance with it furthers both individual and cultural goals. The exaggeration of the ritualization of ideology results in the ritualism of totalism. Totalism involves the unquestioning commitment to overly simplistic ideologies. For example, adolescents may accept the values mouthed by various heroes in religious cults, musical groups, drug cultures, athletics, gangs, films, or political groups. According to Erickson, when adolescents over-identify with such groups or individuals, it is because they seem to provide answers to life's most difficult questions. The simplest thinking involved in totalism, then, can make life easier for the troubled adolescent, and, if it is temporary, it may not be harmful. It is when totalism lasts beyond the time when an identity should be achieved that it becomes a problem. It's important to remember that according to the epigenetic principle, all crises exist in all stages of development. For example, the identity crisis exists in the young child as it does in the mature adult. However, it does so in the immature and resolution phases of the crisis, respectively. For, bio- biological, physiolo- psych- for biological, psychological, and social reasons, it is only during adolescence that the identity crisis exists in its critical phase. Young adulthood, intimacy versus isolation. This stage lasts from about 20 to about 24 years of age. For this and the remaining psychosocial stages, there is no corresponding Freudian psychosexual stage of development. According to Erickson, normalcy for the young adult consists to a large extent of being able to love and work effectively. And on this point, he agreed with Freud. We may ponder, but we cannot improve on the professor's formula. Although Erickson agreed with Freud on the importance of love, he believed only the person with a secure identity can risk entering a loving relationship. The young adult with a strong identity eagerly seeks intimate relationships with others. Erickson insisted that young adults with formed identities were both eager and willing to fuse their identities with others to enter into committed relationships and accept the challenges and sacrifices that such relationships demand. People who do not develop a capacity for productive work and intimacy would draw into themselves, avoid close contacts, and thus develop a feeling of isolation. If individuals develop a greater capacity for intimacy than for isolation in this stage, they will also emerge with the virtue of love. Erickson defined love as the mutuality of devotion forever subduing the antagonisms inherent in divided function. Affiliation versus elitism. Once an identity has been achieved and an ideology has been chosen that allows for the productive manifestation of that identity, a person can affiliate productively with fellow humans in work friendship, and love. The ritualization characterizing this stage is affiliation, the various ways a culture sanctions caring, productive relationships between adults. 
the marriage ceremony, and the subsequent honeymoon are two such sanctioning rituals. The wedding ceremony may involve the exchange of rings and a pledge of fidelity. We see in the wedding ceremony elements of the ritualizations from previous stages. For example, the ceremony casts a numinous, i.e. a feeling of reverence, spell. It has a judicious element in that certain rites are bestowed. The ceremony and subsequent marital relationship may reflect earlier experimentation with role-playing. Formality is reflected in the fact that the ceremony includes elements that must be performed according to accepted practice, and the mutual pledges taken by the man and woman affirm their identities as husband and wife. Affiliation further prepares individuals to live harmoniously with fellow humans within a culture. The exaggeration of the ritualization of affiliation results in the ritualism of elitism. Those individuals who experience a sense of isolation rather than intimacy, tend to surround themselves with a small group of like-minded individuals, rather than forming deeply emotional relationships with healthy individuals. Their lives tend to be characterized by snobbery, status symbols, and membership in exclusive clubs. Because such relationships are not truly intimate, they continue the person's sense of isolation within his, within his or her culture. Adulthood. Generativity versus Stagnation. This occurs from about age 25 to about 64, and is called middle adulthood. If one has been fortunate enough to develop a positive identity and to live a productive, happy life, one attempts to pass on the circumstances that cause such a life to the next generation. This can be done either by interacting with children directly, they need not be one's own, or by producing or creating experiences that will enhance the lives of those in the next generation. The person who does not develop a sense of generativity is characterized by stagnation and interpersonal impoverishment. If the ratio of generativity is to stagnation is in favor of the former, one leaves the stage with the virtue of care that Erickson defined as the widening concern for what has been generated by love, necessity, or accident. It overcomes the ambivalence adhering to irreversible obligation. Generalization, generalization, general Gen generationalism versus authoritism. The ritualization characterizing this stage of generationalism that involves the many ways in which older adults transmit cultural values to the next generation. Parents, teachers, physicians, and spiritual leaders are especially influential in conveying cultural values to children. Healthy adults are concerned with providing children with the same types of experiences they were fortunate to have that is, with experiences that both facilitate personality growth and perpetuate cultural values. The exaggeration of the ritualization of general, generationalism results in the ritualism of authoritism. Authoritism occurs when authority figures in the culture use their power not for the care and instruction of the young, but for their own selfish purposes. Old age, ego integrity versus despair. This stage occurs from about the age of 65 to death and is called late adulthood. Erickson defined ego integrity as a ripening of both successes and frustrations of previous stages in individuals who are both originators and generators during their lives. According to Erickson, the person who can look back on a rich, constructive, happy life does not fear death. Such a person has a feeling of completion and fulfillment. The person who looks back on life with frustration experiences despair. As strange as it may seem, the person experiencing despair is not as ready for death as the person who, with a sense of fulfillment because the former has not yet achieved any major goals in life. Not only are the eight stages progressively related to each other, but the eight stages is directly related to the first. In other words, the eight stages are interrelated in a circular fashion. For example, the adult's attitude towards death will directly influence the young child's sense of trust. Erickson said that infants will develop trust not fear life if they have experience with older adults who do not fear death. If the person who has more ego integrity than despair, his or her life will be characterized by the virtue of wisdom that Erickson defined as detached concern with life itself in face of death itself. Int integralism versus sapationism. If all has gone well in a person's life, that person realizes how instrumental he or she has been in perpetuating culture. That is, the person has a sense of immortality, knowing that the culture he or she helps sustain will survive his or her own death. The ritualization of integralism involves the final unification of previous ritualizations. 
This last integration of ritualizations puts life and therefore death into perspective. We can see now what rituals must accomplish by combining and renewing the ritualizations of childhood and affirming generative sanction. They help to consolidate adult life once its commitments and investments have led to the creation of new persons and the production of new things and ideas. And of course, by tying life cycle and institutions into a meaningful whole, they create a sense of immortality, not only for the leaders and the elite, but also for every participant. The exaggeration of the ritualization of integralism results in the ritualism of sapientism that Erickson defined as the unwise pretense of being wise. The older person, experiencing despair instead of ego integrity, may play the role of a person having all the answers, of being absolutely right. However, he or she is unable to place his or her life in the context of continuous cultural evolution. Such a life is viewed as having little meaning. The eight stages of development and their associated crises, virtues, ritualizations, and ritualisms are summarized in Table 6-1 above. The Goal of Psychotherapy Erickson stressed that his psychotherapeutic practices differ from those of traditional psychoanalysis because modern times have created different types of disorders. For example, Erickson explained that while patients used to be concerned with their inhibitions and how to overcome them, they are now more concerned with what they should believe in and who they should become. For Erickson, the main focus in the therapeutic process is the patient's ego that must be strengthened to the point at which it can cope with life's problems. Rehabilitation work can be made more effective and economical if the clinical investigation focuses on the patient's shattered life plan and if advice tends to strengthen the resynthesis of the elements on which the patient's ego identity was based. Erickson believed the traditional technique of releasing the contents of the unconscious mind may do more harm than good. Erickson said the psychoanalytic method may make some people sicker than they ever were, especially if, in our zealous pursuit of our task of making conscious the psychotherapeutic situation, we push someone who is leaning out a little too far over the precipice of the unconscious. Like Adler, Erickson had his patients sit across from him in an easy chair rather than lie down on a couch because the former creates a more equitable situation for the patient. Briefly stated, the healthy person is one whose ego is characterized by the eight virtues resulting from the positive solution of each crisis in the eight stages of development. The purpose of psychotherapy is to encourage the growth of whatever virtues are missing, even if it means going back and helping the person to develop a sense of basic trust. For Erickson, the outcome of every crisis resolution is reversible. For example, the person leaving the first stage of development without basic trust may later gain it, and the person having it may lose it. Friedman summarizes Erickson's view of therapy as follows. Erickson characterized the premise that an early life experience invariably determined subsequent psychological development as the originology fallacy. Most important, he felt that the clinician must always remember that therapist-patient connection was essentially a relationship through which both parties gained by giving. Successful therapy was largely the practice of the golden rule, possibly no more, certainly, and certainly no less. Comparison of Erickson and Freud The three major areas in which Erickson and Freud differ are listed in Table 6-2. Once again, Remember that Erickson is considered a neo-Freudian because although his theory was based on Freud's significant, differences are apparent. Evaluation. Empirical research. Like so many personality theories, Erickson's theory cannot be evaluated only on the basis of laboratory investigations, at least not yet. Erickson did not create his theory with the researcher in mind. He attempted to classify conceptually several items related to personality development and one either believes they are clarified or they are not. Either his theory is a useful guide to understanding personality or it is not. The proof lies in the way in which the communication between the therapist and patient keeps moving, leading to new and surprising insights into the patient's greater assumption and responsibility for himself. The point is that Erickson believed there are ways other than laboratory investigations to evaluate a personality theory. Despite Erickson's thoughts about the need to verify his theory scientifically, Others have taken it on themselves to do just that. In 2010, Bayers and Steve Crank 
examined and examined whether identity came before intimacy and early adult development. Using interview and questionnaire data, these researchers followed adolescents from the age of 15 to 25. They found that identity did precede intimacy in their sample of both men and women. A similar study conducted by Vangvis, Carlson, and Van der Lee and Freysen found that young adults with a more developed sense of identity were more likely to have committed romantic relationships. Both of these studies seem to confirm the importance of hierarchical order on Erickson stages. By far, most of the research centered by Erickson's theory has involved the concept of identity. Although Erickson probably would not agree with such efforts, several researchers have devised methods of quantifying the concept of identity so that it can be investigated experimentally. Marcia, in particular, has conducted extensive research on this topic over the last 20 years, developing identity statuses. These statuses are categories of different levels of identity development. These statuses have been used to explore many variables in identity development. Marcia and Jostelson extend the idea of statuses to later Ericksonian stages as well, developing statuses for all Erickson's adult developmental stages. In these later adult stages of development, people are more engaged in issues of intimacy, generativity, and ego integration than in issues of identity. Nonetheless, it is successful identity, it is successful identity achievement that enables the development of intimacy, generativity, and general well-being. Criticisms. Difficult to test empirically. We have seen that Erickson had little interest in testing his own theory empirically, and what research he does report, i.g. his research on the play activities of boys and girls, lacks quantification and statistical analysis. Others, however, have had some success in verifying some Ericksonian concepts related to the stages of development and especially that of identity. Overly optimistic view of humans. Although claiming a close affiliation with Freud's theory, Erickson painted a much rosier picture of humans than Freud did. Little in Erickson's theory describes an intense struggle to keep our animalistic nature in check. By emphasizing and expanding the functioning of an ego, Erickson concentrated on problems of identity, problem solving, and interpersonal relationships, rather than on the taming of powerful sexual and aggressive instincts. To some critics, Erickson's portrayal of humans is too optimistic, unrealistic, and simplistic. Support of status quo. Essentially, Eric defined a healthy person as one who adjusts to, accepts, and passes on to the next generation the elements of his or her culture. To many critics, this definition sounds like Erickson was advocating conformity. Indeed, Erickson insisted that ego development is enhanced by engaging in the cultural ritualizations that are available at various stages of development. In other words, Erickson insisted that healthy egos require the support of culturally sanctioned roles and many view this insistence as endorsement of those roles. For those seeing gross injustices, dangerous values, shallowness, and even stupidity in their culture, it makes little sense to define mental health in terms of alignment with those factors. Excessive moralizing. Erickson's definition of the positive adjustments to crisis at various stages of development are in accordance with Christian ethics and with existing social institutions. The danger in this, as in all personality theories, is that Erickson may have been describing his own values rather than objective reality. Rosen elaborates, Confusing ought and is statements can lead to undesirable consequences. There is the danger of conservatism, throwing a mantle of morality over the pre-existing world and endorsing whether that already is with an ethical sanction. Erickson's message communicates too much of what we want to hear. His hopefulness is too often allied to social conservatism. Rosen comments further on Erickson's moralizing. As one reflects on the implication of Erickson's eco-psychology with its differential attitude toward the benefits of pre-existing social institutions, a consistent ethical mood does emerge. Marriage, heterosexuality, and the raising of children are unquestionably part of what he takes the good life to consist of. The criticism that Erickson's theory is too moralistic is closely related to the criticism that his theory supports the status quo. Failure to properly acknowledge influences on his theory. One criticism here concerns Erickson's insistence on being a post-Freudian when in fact little of substance is similar between his theory and Freud's. It has been suggested that Erickson continued to label himself a Freudian to avoid being excommunicated from psychoanalytic circles. In other words, it has been suggested that his 
motives were pragmatic and political. Conversely, Erickson, although giving perhaps too much credit to Freud, neglected to properly acknowledge theorists such as Adler and Ornai, who stressed the importance of social variables before Erickson. Contributions Expansion of Psychology's Domain Despite Erickson's lack of scientific rigor, his theory is considered by many to be one of the most useful ever developed. Henceforth, when you encounter the terms psychosocial development, ego strength, psychohistory, identity, identity crisis, and lifespan psychology, keep in mind that they are concepts that were first articulated by Erickson and have since become an important part of psychology. Considerable Applied Value Erickson's theory has been successfully used in such areas as child psychology and psychiatry, vocational counseling, marital counseling, education, social work, and business. Finally, development of ego psychology. By developing and promoting ego psychology, Erickson encouraged the study of healthy people in addition to neurotics and psychotics, encouraged the study of personality development across the entire lifespan, and painted a dignified picture of humans. Also, by rejecting Freud's contention that society is necessarily a source of conflict and frustration, and by stressing the positive influence of society instead, Erickson promoted the integration of psychology with such disciplines as sociology and anthropology. Summary. Although Erickson had only the equivalent of a high school diploma, he was invited to work in a small school established to care for children who either were receiving therapy from Anna Freud or had parents who were receiving therapy from Sigmund Freud. Erickson worked as a tutor for a while, but eventually went into training to become a child analyst under the supervision of Anna Freud. Anna Freud's interest in the ego had a lasting effect on Erickson, who is usually credited with founding ego psychology. Ego psychology emphasizes the autonomous function of the ego and de-emphasizes the importance of the id to personality development. Erickson agreed with Freud that one's gender markedly influences one's personality, but he believed anatomical differences always interact with societal influences to produce individual differences. Furthermore, he did not believe that masculine traits are better or worse than feminine traits. Rather, he believed masculine and feminine traits complement each other. The most widely known aspect of Erickson's theory is his description of the eight stages of personality development. According to Erickson's epigenetic principle, the stages unfold in a sequence that is genetically determined. Each of the eight stages is characterized by a crisis that can be resolved positively or negatively. The stages and the crisis characterizing them are 1. Infancy, basic trust versus basic mistrust. 2. Early childhood, autonomy versus shame and doubt. 3. Preschool age, initiative versus guilt. 4. School age, industry versus inferiority. 5. Adolescence. Identity versus role confusion. Six, young adulthood, intimacy versus isolation. Seven, adulthood, generativity versus stagnation. And eight, old age, ego integrity versus despair. Society provides experiences that are conducive to the positive resolutions of the various crises. Such experiences are called ritualizations. Distortions or exaggerations of ritualizations are called ritualisms. The ritualization characterizing the first stage is the numinous whereby the child's positive interactions with his or her mother make the child generally socially responsive. When the numinous is exaggerated, it becomes the ritualism of idolism or the excessive admiration of people. The ritualization characterizing the second stage is judiciousness, through which the child learns the cultural definition of right and wrong. The exaggeration of judiciousness results in the ritualism of legalism, that is a preoccupation with laws, instead of what those laws are designed to accomplish. The ritualization corresponding to the third stage is authenticity, that involves playing several roles to examine possibilities for living one's life. The exaggeration of authenticity results in the ritualism of impersonation, whereby a person confuses a role he or she is playing with his or her true personality. The, ritualiz- the ritualization characterized in the fourth stage is a formality that involves learning the correct way of acting in a culture. The exaggeration of a formality results in the ritualism of formalism that is an over-concern with how tasks are done instead of why they are done. The ritualization characterizing the fifth stage is ideology. That involves embracing a philosophy of life that synthesizes all previous ego developments. The exaggeration of ideology results in the ritualism of totalism, 
or the embracing of simplistic ideas because they seem to make life easier. The ritualization of characterizing sixth stage is affiliation that involves the sharing of one's life in caring productive ways with fellow humans. The exaggeration of affiliation results in the ritualism of elitism, where one's life is shared superficially with small groups of individuals similar to oneself. The ritualization characterized in the seventh stage is generationalism that involves all the ways in which healthy adults help the younger generation adjust positively to their culture. The exaggeration of generationalism results in the ritualization of authoritism that involves the use of one's authority for self-serving reasons. The ritualization of characterizing the eighth stage is integralism that involves a synthesizing of all the elements of one's life. The exaggeration of integralism results in the ritualism of sapientism, that is, the pretense of being wise. If a crisis is resolved positively, a virtue will be gained that strengthens the ego. If the crisis characterizes the eight stages of development are resolved positively, the person will live later years with the virtues of hope, will, purpose, competence, fidelity, love, care, and wisdom. Such a person was considered healthy by Erickson because he or she looks back on life with positive feelings and does not fear death. Children familiar with older people with these attributes are more likely to develop basic trust than basic mistrust. One of the most important stages of development is the fifth stage because it is when the identity crisis occurs. It is during this stage that people attempt to learn who they are and where they are going in life. If people find answers to these questions, they will leave this stage with an identity. If not, they will leave the stage with a role confusion. It is also possible for people to develop a negative identity, which is the antithesis of a role that society has deemed desirable. For Erickson, the outcomes of the experiences during the stages of development are reversible. That is, a favorable outcome can become unfavorable, and an unfavorable outcome can become favorable. In fact, Erickson viewed the therapeutic process mainly as a means of reversing the negative outcomes of various stages of development. For Erickson, the goal of therapy was to strengthen the conscious ego rather than to understand the contents of the unconscious mind, as was the case of Freud. Many other differences exist between Freud's theory and Erickson's. For example, Freud viewed religion as a collective neurosis based on infantile desires, fear, and ignorance. Erickson, conversely, viewed religion as a conducive as conducive to healthy adjustment. Although Erickson believed no need exists to test his theory empirically, others have made attempts to do so. Most of the research generated by Erickson's theory has focused on the stages of development and on his concept of identity. These studies have tended to support predictions based on Erickson's theory. Erickson's theory has been criticized for being generally difficult to test empirically, portraying humans too simplistically or too optimistically, supporting the status quo, and for being too moralistic. Also, Erickson has been criticized for not properly acknowledging those who influenced him. Erickson's contributions include the expansion of psychology's domain, the widespread usefulness of his theory, the development of ego psychology, that is, as that, that it is concerned with healthy people as with unhealthy people, that his theory studies personality development across the entire lifespan, and that it stresses the fact that societal forces are conducive to personality development and are therefore not necessarily a source of conflict and frustration. Here are the discussion questions. One, two, and three. And the next page, our glossary. And our glossary.